I would now like to introduce today's special guest. It wasn't long ago that the majority of Canadian businesses, uh, business leaders, didn't really believe that climate change was material to their business. That's really no longer true at all. Concern over the environment now tops public opinion polls year in, year out, and is rapidly changing uh, at government and corporate levels across our country as well as throughout the world. No longer the preserve of scientists and political activists, it now occupies the mainstream of everyday discussion. Climate change is a reality which poses a serious threat to the future development of world societies, ecosystems, and economies. Global leaders, politicians, and financial authorities alike are now calling climate change the economic challenge of our 21st century. We cannot continue with business as usual, the UN Secretary General recently said. The time has come for decisive action on a global scale. And from Virgin's Sir Richard Branson, global business is both part of the problem as well as the solution. For those of us in business and finance, climate change is no longer a fringe concern, and focusing on companies' brand and its corporate and social responsibility. It's become an increasingly central topic for strategic deliberation and decision-making by executives and investors around the globe. Climate change, like globalization, technical change, and population aging, is likely to be another powerful force that exonerably shapes our economic environment. Asset prices can move sharply and can be affected by many factors as the dramatic rise in oil price this past year is clearly demonstrated. But while climate change may well be a slowing or slow moving force, over the long term businesses are likely to be just as affected both by climate change itself and the policies needed to address it. Within each sector, many firms will find ways of turning change to their advantage while others will fail to adopt. The firms that will prosper in a climate changed world will tend to be those that are eagerly eager and early to recognize its importance. They'll be the ones that foresee at least some of the implications for their industry and take appropriate actions to take advantage. Necessity is the mother of all invention and climate change is not just a risk and a challenge to humanity but also creates significant opportunity to create innovative solutions and new ventures. Our guest speaker heads one of North America's largest energy and energy service providers, a sector at the eye of the climate change storm. Direct Energy has taken a lead position on addressing climate change, investing in low and zero carbon power generation, offering green products and services. It also supports carbon gap and trade mechanisms to deliver absolute carbon reductions. Our speaker uh, today is um, going to share with you some of his views, thoughts, and opinions on where they are at Direct Energy and where they're going in the future. Please join me in welcoming to our podium today Mr. Derek King, President and CEO of Centrica North America and Chairman and CEO of Direct Energy. Well, thanks, Alan, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I have to start by thanking you for turning up on such a wonderful Friday afternoon. I'm just relieved it's not a long weekend. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today to have the opportunity to speak with you about just a few aspects of climate change. Um, as Alan said, most of us are already aware that climate change presents a risk, but we're not always clear what that risk is. You know, is it to our businesses? Is it to our communities, our families, you know, perhaps our, our wallets? Um, so what I want to do today is to try and shed some light on the risks, focusing on business. And I'll also touch on what we can do to try and mitigate those risks. And Alan was telling me over lunch of the sort of the famous roster of, of speakers uh, that have addressed the Canadian Club, so I was rather humbled. and. Um, it did remind me of the remarks of one of my countrymen who, who has spoken here, 
Uh, his reputation for oratory was a, a little better than mine. Um, but in the late 1930s, as Britain's leaders refused to acknowledge the threat that Hitler posed, Winston Churchill observed, he said, the era of procrastination, of half measures, of soothing and baffling expedients of delays is coming to a close. In its place, we're entering a period of consequences. And you know, Churchill's quote is equally appropriate today because we've entered the age of carbon consequences. We have to progress beyond procrastination and half measures. And as key stakeholders, business leaders must now ensure that managing and adapting to what I describe as carbon risk is embraced in their decision making. This will protect not only their businesses, but also the health, the safety, and the future of the communities in which we all live and work. And we can only hope that our generation will be remembered like the generation who lived and fought through the Second World War for our resolve and our determination to tackle this challenge head on. And we must start by recognizing that climate change poses a serious business risk with major strategic, operational, reputational, legal, and financial implications. The cost of doing nothing, the cost of inaction, will ultimately far outweigh the cost of action. And the sooner we begin, the brighter our economic and social future will be. And as the Conference Board of Canada noted recently, businesses that ignore the debate over climate change do so at their peril. So to try and shed some light on uh, what we're facing and how we need to prepare, I'd, I'd like to uh, speak about three things today. First, there's the global energy landscape. Now, in our land of plentiful natural resources, this has never mattered too much to Canadians. In the past, we were okay, but we're increasingly exposed to global trends. And for us, trust me, global is gradually becoming local. The second consideration I'll talk about is carbon legislation and pricing, one of the big political hot potatoes of the moment. And the third consideration is what all of this means for Canadian business. So let's start with the energy landscape, and, and let me start by stating the obvious. Energy is more expensive than it's ever been. You know, oil prices have doubled since a year ago, and they passed the previous inflation-adjusted price level on February the 29th this year, and they've gone on since. Now, soaring demand in developing countries is clearly a major factor, and the emergence of commodities as a new uh, what's called investor asset class, for which read Haven for Speculation, is, uh, is playing its part. Supply of oil is on a knife edge, and just one incident in one major producing territory could easily lead to the $250 oil that Russia's Gazprom was forecasting only last week. There's also a growing continental gas, natural gas deficit in North America, with demand growth from the oil sands and for power generation outpacing what is essentially static domestic production. And this deficit will grow and could reach 10% of North American demand in just five years' time. That will have to be satisfied by conservation and by imports of liquefied natural gas, LNG, from the likes of Qatar, Nigeria, Egypt, Russia, Algeria, Trinidad, you're not the most inspiring list of suppliers. And for the first time, North American consumers will be exposed to pricing influences from far afield, not just in Europe, but also in Asia. The prices that these competing markets are prepared to pay for gas, they've priced LNG out of the North American market for most of this year. And if I tell you that the forward winter price in the UK is now north of $20 a million BTU, that's over twice the Canadian price level, you know, that future doesn't look much better for us. The public response to high prices doesn't bode well for action on climate change. In North America, we have something of an entitlement culture on energy, and we become outraged when our bills go up 
And we demand that our political leaders do something about it. And they respond by feeding that energy subsidy culture. Yet we have natural gas rebates in Alberta. We have subsidized hydro in Ontario. And then we have the Clinton and McCain proposals down in the US to suspend the US federal gasoline tax for this summer. Subsidizing energy is a very significant disincentive to conserve. It's also a, a disincentive to invest in new clean technologies. It's a wrong-headed approach that just panders to political gain and it ignores the environment, the environmental and economic realities that Canada is facing. Not to mention the tax burden that this subsidy culture creates. Political leaders cannot say that the environment is their top priority and then strip away any sense of urgency by maintaining price caps, rebates and subsidies. So let's turn now to something that will also affect the cost of energy, the price of carbon. First, the good news. There are few dissenters now to the view that action has to be taken to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We're fast forwarding from whether something needs to be done through what has to be done onto how it's to be done. And there's been much talk about the merits of two mechanisms, the carbon tax on the one hand, the cap and trade system on the other. And if you're confused, you're not alone because it confuses the hell out of me. So I'm going to try, take my life in my hands and shed some light onto this. And forgive me if I'm, as they say in England, but apparently not in Canada, I'm told, teaching my grandmother to suck eggs. <laughs> but um, a, ca a cap and trade system sets greenhouse gas emission goals for producers in a range of industries, the so-called large emitters. And producers have to meet an assigned emissions target. Or alternatively, if they can't do that, they have to buy credits in a traded market. And the cost of emission credits, the so-called price of carbon, lets the market find a price for carbon which leads to the desired goal. Carbon tax, on the other hand, is levied on users of energy, and it starts by setting the price of carbon, the tax, at a level that government predicts will lead to the desired emissions reductions to be achieved. Now, I'm a strong believer in cap and trade, and, and here's why. First and foremost, cap and trade sets a clear, unequivocal target for emissions reduction. And after all, that is the name of the game. Second, it's a proven free market mechanism. It enables the carbon change, the carbon price to react to change to meet the desired goal. And when a cap and trade system is designed effectively, the price of emission credits provides a real incentive for businesses to either reduce their greenhouse gas emissions or to operate more efficiently and invest in clean technology, or hopefully all of those things. My third problem with a carbon tax is that I've got little confidence in anyone's ability, let alone that of a politically motivated government, to set the level of a tax to meet any desired outcome. And fourth, despite protestations that tax receipts would be fully recycled into the economy, you know, who amongst us really has the confidence that that will happen in practice? The cap and trade system has already been tested and proven to work in Europe. And I have to say, after what, I'd, uh, I, after what I'd be the first to say was a deeply flawed start in Europe, a market-based approach underpinned by tough emissions targets mandated by the European Union has created a highly liquid market in emission permits at a price level, it's around $40 a ton of CO2, that is already making a difference. In the UK, it's led to huge investment in renewable and cleaner energy without any recourse to government subsidies. Now, this isn't to say that carbon taxes have no place in reducing emissions, because it's impractical to apply cap and trade to, to you and me as, as consumers. So a carbon tax on consumption may be the best way to incent changes in consumer behavior. Although 
the impact on behavior may be less than anticipated. I'll give you an example. European roads are more crowded than ever, despite gasoline at $2.40 a litre. I was in England yesterday, $2.40 a litre, and we think we have problems. On the other hand, Europeans generally drive vehicles with much, much better fuel economy than the average Canadian. So back to cap and trade, if the marketplace is given a clear set of rules, it's generally proved to be remarkably effective at finding solutions. But unfortunately, here in Canada, we are not giving anyone, we're not getting clear direction. In fact, we're proceeding in a quite disjointed way. You know, last year, provinces of BC and Manitoba joined seven US states in the Western Climate Initiative, a regional cap and trade scheme. BC's followed up this year with a carbon tax on the use of energy. You have to say, on Gordon Campbell's behalf, a pretty bold move that the rest of Canada and certainly BC citizens are watching very intently. Alberta, of course, has decided to go its own way, fearful that development of the oil sands will be impeded in some way. And then only last week, Ontario and Quebec announced a joint cap and trade initiative that it appears at least will have some very bold targets uh, not inconsistent with, uh, with Kyoto. The federal government appears committed to cap and trade but continues to talk in terms of carbon intensity which measures greenhouse gas emissions per unit of output. So if a company's output rises, total emissions can rise with it. And my concern about that is that an intensity-based approach will not deliver the required results. And as important, will be viewed internationally as Canada either pleading for special treatment or seeking to avoid its obligations. And leaving aside all of that, what struck me most is this unedifying rhetoric that's been used by both Ottawa and the provinces. At a time when clear heads need to prevail, our political leaders have resorted to entrenched positions and name-calling. How on earth is industry supposed to make investment decisions against this patchwork quilt of possible legislation? Canada needs and must have consistent emissions legislation across the nation. If we look to the south, you know, I believe that the U.S. is now moving inexorably towards coordinated national action after that same patchy start. A week ago today, the U.S. Senate debated the Climate Security Act, better known as the Lieberman-Warner Bill, a bill which would cap emissions from over 75% of the U.S. economy with very tough, medium, and long-term targets. Now that bill did not get the 60 votes required to overcome a Republican filibuster and move forward. But it did get 48 votes in favor. And if you take the 48 votes plus the six votes, the six absent supporters who would have voted in favor had they been there, including Senators McCain, Obama, and Clinton, that's a big step forward from just 38 senators who supported action on climate change in 2005. There's huge industry support for Lieberman Warner, and I still believe that that bill will form the basis of legislation that the new U.S. president will sign into law in the not far distant future. And interestingly, and key to getting the developing nations on board, that legislation would have required importers of goods from countries without acceptable emissions targets to submit to U.S. allowances for the calculated carbon content. And that could have a material adverse impact, for example, on the import of oil sands crude into the U.S. in the absence of similar strong legislation in Canada. So I said I'd uh, try to talk about what business is, is to make of, of all this. And I think first we have to recognize what um, management guru Jim Collins would call some brutal truths. Addressing climate change will come with a cost. It won't be pain-free. In part, the cost will be slower, 
economic growth, but it will not be zero growth or economic disaster. The pain will not be felt uniformly. Energy intensive manufacturing will be harder hit. And I don't suppose that producers of trucks and SUVs will do too well. And rural communities will be hard hit by any environmental levies or taxes on gasoline. So at the policy level, it's critical that business contributes to the debate and that its views are heard and respected and taken into account. And in this context, I think there are four key principles that have to be established. First, Although there are probably now too many stakes in the ground to make a single national emissions plan possible, there is a possibility of aligning provincial plans into some form of consistent framework so we know what we're dealing with. Second, the proceeds from any tax or levy or emissions permit auction you know, has to be recycled into the economy and not used just as another source of revenue by governments. Third, Canada's competitiveness against nations that don't play ball on climate change must not be compromised. And last, there has to be meaningful and conspicuous support for green technology development. Renewables, clean coal power generation, carbon sequestration, nuclear technology, energy efficiency, demand response, smart meters, and so on. That's a great list of opportunity, isn't it? And you know, it's not, as I've said before, it's not a question of choice. And this is where I part company with David Suzuki. It's not a question of choice. I believe we have to do all of those things and more to achieve the effect that's necessary. At the operational level, the sooner companies come to grips with the consequences of these likely emission reduction mechanisms, the faster they'll adapt and the greater their chances of weathering the storm. In, the second, in its second annual survey of Canadian emitters last year, Deloitte found that three quarters had prepared an emissions inventory. 57% had evaluated reduction options, but only 27% had integrated emissions management as part of their business strategy. In other words, three quarters of Canadian companies do not have a strategy in this respect. Direct Energy, we have a consulting business that helps organizations assess energy usage patterns and help them develop a sustainable future, and our experiences confirm that Deloitte, those Deloitte results. And you know, for starters, an inventory of emissions will help assess the business risks and the opportunities. As we know, what gets measured gets managed. By using energy and other resources more efficiently, production costs can be reduced, competitiveness can be improved. And further and really and increasingly important, reducing greenhouse gas emissions can differentiate your business in an increasingly environmentally conscious marketplace. In my company, Direct Energy, we have a multifaceted plan. At the parent company level, we measure and we publish our emissions performance. We have set targets and we've committed to these publicly in our annual corporate responsibility report. Our 2007 report was published two weeks ago. If you want to look at that, you can find it on our website, www.centrica.com. We're active developments in the legislative development process across Canada. We contribute in various industry forums, and as part of Canada, Canadian industry's call for effective nationally coordinated policy, were members of the Canadian Council of Chief Executives Environmental Task Force. Now we have a business in, in North America with revenues of $10 billion a year. Nine billion of those dollars are sales of energy. So we recognize that we could and probably will be hard hit by lower growth or even demand reduction as energy efficiency programs kick in. So we've started to diversify our business to compensate. We offer a carbon neutral natural gas product across Canada. We've shifted the emphasis in our services business to the most energy efficient heating and cooling equipment. 
We've bought a stake in Ceres Power, a leading fuel cell developer, and we've created star two startup businesses to exploit the new growth potential, our wholesale new energy business, through which we're becoming an active player in emergent carbon trading, and as I referenced earlier, our direct energy consulting business. And finally, we've engaged in pilot programs for both demand response and smart metering programs in both Canada and the U.S. Internally, we're addressing the carbon footprint of our own business activities, including capital projects to reduce carbon emissions of our vehicle fleet, our property portfolio. We carbon offset all of our travel. Early on, I think you know, we recognize that leadership from the top is an absolute prerequisite. Only when the CEO of the company sets the agenda and the other C-suite executives climb on board do meaningful things start to get done. So we set the stage at Direct Energy by committing as a leadership team to be one of the first carbon neutral boards in North America by the end of this year. Now, as we took these steps, we were amazed by the groundswell of support from across our organization. Our people told us that they were proud to work for an organization that wanted to do the right thing. Champions emerged at all levels in the company who are actively taking this process forward right across the business and in their local communities. So let me finish by saying once again that the consequences of climate change are upon us. Procrastination is no longer an option. So my call is for everyone in this room to get involved either indirectly or directly by engaging with political and regulatory leaders. I hope also that each of you will undertake an immediate or hope seek to undertake an immediate inventory of emissions in your organizations to assess and understand the business risks and opportunities in your organizations. To that end, I'd like to close with a challenge which is that all the business leaders present here today take steps to measure and report through the Carbon Disclosure Project. In 2007, just 88 Canadian companies responded to the Carbon Disclosure Project. This year's questionnaire was mailed out on February the 1st to over 3,000 companies worldwide and over 200 of Canada's largest companies. The questionnaire asked companies to measure and disclose their greenhouse gas emissions and report on their strategy for dealing with risks and opportunities associated with climate change. To restate my earlier point, what gets measured gets managed, and what gets managed gets done. With that, I'd like to thank you for your kind attention, and I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Derek, I think, uh, thank you very much. I think in most part you've answered uh, the questions that have come to me. Um, as you were concluding there, you made some comments uh, as you challenged uh, some business leaders. So let me, let me start with that. With all the issues around the economy at present, how would you recommend getting CEOs interested slash involved in setting climate change strategy? Like what incentive is there? That's a very, that's a very good question. Um, uh, but I, I will start by saying that you know, Canada so far has you know, weathered a lot of the, the uh, economic challenges that, that are being felt down in the States. There are countervailing forces here. You could argue that if the economy is in the toilet, you know, this is the wrong time to be increasing costs on industry and consumers. And there's some merit in that argument. You know, timing, as we know, is everything. But, you know, we have to make a start. And the longer we delay that start, the more painful it will be eventually. And we are being helped by you know, very high energy prices. So projects which might have paid back in five years, you know, months ago, might now pay back in three or four years. So I think you know, those two countervailing forces you know, will balance to some extent um, but no matter you know, how tough the economic going, 
I think we have to make a start, and we have to make that start now. Thanks. Can you explain how direct energy views uh, encouraging the sale of less of your product? So if you're asking people to reduce their footprint, are you asking them to consume less of your product? Yes, I am. And um, two, two things on that. One is that you know, people often ask, what, what on earth are you doing here as the leader of an energy company suggesting people should use less of your product? Um, and, and I answer by simply saying it, it's the right thing to do. You know, some things transcend narrow corporate interests. And as I said, we're taking steps to recognize that our core business will be harmed and we have to diversify into new businesses. Uh, and, I, and I think that's, that's simply you know, the right thing to do. The second thing is, I think by being the head of an energy company who is prepared to stand up and be counted in public, uh, it, it lends credibility to the argument. I don't think I have any hidden agenda here. I don't have any access. I haven't got a sneaky plan that somehow this is going to rebound and really benefit us. It's not. It's going to hurt our company both at the corporate level and here in North America. Well, thank you. I want to call on Kathy Honor, uh, director of, uh, of the club, to provide some formal thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. King, for joining us here today. I'd like to close today's event with another quote from someone very well known. Climate change poses clear, catastrophic, catastrophic threats. We may not agree to the extent, but we certainly can't afford the risk of inaction. The climate won't wait for us. And no, that wasn't Al Gore, that was Rupert Murdoch. As business leaders, we are also citizens of this globe we all live on. We have to commit ourselves to solving what is a growing consensus to be the biggest challenge to face the human race. Business today is transnational, truly global, and offers so many advantages to all of us. But now we all have to demonstrate what globalization can do for the globe. As Derek King has so well demonstrated with his own example and direct, leadership, direct energy's leadership, our resourcefulness and our capacity to come up with energy emissions management strategies are so essential to overcoming this. Inaction is not an option. Thank you so much, Derek, for educating us and inspiring us today. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, and thank uh, all of you for joining us for lunch today. That is the end of our lunch. Have a great afternoon.